this is the first uh, seminar in a series of seminars where we will focus in on regulation of work. A second one is planned for February, which will look at the international one side, uh, section. Today's one, as you've seen from the invite that went out, would be primarily be looking at uh, trade union rights, particularly for South African workers who are not taken out to be or defined as employees in terms of the LRA. And so we will look at the organizational issues that impact on these uh, workers, but also look at some of the constitutional issues uh, which impact on these workers. I think in our discussions with Gabriel LaRue, uh, who has both already agreed to share with us some of his experiences around organizing uh, musicians in South Africa and some of the organizational and legislative and constitutional issues and challenges that they are confronted by. And uh, then Paul, who has been doing some work around this issue, Paul, Professor Paul Benjamin, will be the respondent and will pick up. Uh, Gabriel has indicated that they don't have all the answers, uh, but what he intends doing is sharing with us some of the key issues that impact on the group of workers that they organize, but which can also be shared with other groups of workers who suffer the same problem of not being defined as employees in terms of the other day and what could be done uh, both in the short term and the long and the long term to sort out this problem so uh, can we call on gabriel leroux professor to toy could you uh, switch off your camera please uh, gabriel you may go Gabriel, you on mute. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks so much to all of you for taking this bit of time out to, to join us on this very, very important to us, uh, incredibly important uh, issue around the status of, of creative workers uh, and the informal sector on a larger, from a larger perspective. I feel really honored and I feel humbled in the presence of uh, such a mixture of, um, you know, of academic brilliance, of uh, creative uh, excellence and people of all, um, you know, uh, areas of society and particularly from the South African perspective, uh, given our history and also the need for us to, um, you know, to shape ourselves into a, a cultural union and to a cultural unity that can hold its own on international markets. So for for me to have the opportunity to address all of you on some of our issues is really a true honor. Let me start off by saying that I think, you know, for us um, as musicians, I've been in the industry 40, 47 years as a professional. Uh, I've experienced, you know, your typical things that any musician, I think, worldwide would experience is your own uh, grappling with your own creativity and having to convey your expression in a consumable form to a consumer market. Um, people with various tastes, people with various, uh, you know, needs for being entertained or not entertained and uh, people coming from also different spheres of life, different social, uh, should I say, standings, socioeconomic backgrounds. And in the case of South Africa, I think we, all, we can all recognize that we are rather peculiar uh, when compared to most other nations in terms of our history of oppression, cultural oppression, um, and, com and economic oppression, and, you know, just uh, our nation divided, um, and with the very, very uh, regrettable past of, of such oppression, 
colonialism, apartheid, etc. But having said that and created that as a, a as a background, I would like to to share with you that uh, for me as a veteran musician, having come through the, the you know my career even in the days of apartheid. The irony is that many, many of the problems that we're experiencing now are exactly the same as what they were in the days of apartheid. In fact, in some instances, uh, I can share you anecdotes with you know myself and guys like Johnny Clegg and them having to go and perform way back in, in, in stadiums like, like uh, what still used to be called Ellis Park Stadium then. We would have had to submit our lyrics to state officials for their scrutiny to, uh, to censor our lyrics, basically, what which songs we were allowed to perform and not perform. Um, that led to early activism amongst many of us. Uh, many of us saying, well, we, were not, we will not take part in such concerts. Some of us uh, went on to become so activist that we, we met the direct wrath of the apartheid regime and got thrown in jail and got persecuted. Others uh, perhaps walked a tighter line to that and managed to to not get that, um, you know, to not get that uh, close scrutiny on, on their work. But more from a perspective of a career, making a career, um, it was difficult then and it's still difficult now. And the reasons for that are largely the same. And these are all pointing at the fact that we, way back as we are now, we are considered so-called informal workers. Now, I can assure all of you that in the sense that we, like all others, have children, we have aspirations, we live in houses, mostly of mostly which are not owned by us, only the more affluent musicians, which is a tiny, tiny group, are able to afford their own houses. Most of us rent our accommodation, most of us have to go to the banks for loans to get even a very modest uh, car or transport we have to buy our equipment we have to when we have children they have got to go to preschool and school if we want medical we have to pay for that everything else that any other person who's employed and who's defined as a worker or as a professional has to go through we go through as well and the difference being that the assumption is made about us as an informal sector that each of us should have been, as we were born with this gift of creativity and the ability to express ourselves in some art form or another, somehow, fantastically, we should all also have the skills of being great accountants and great tax consultants and great business managers and great entrepreneurs, which of course is, is an unrealistic expectation. Um, if you look at your average accountant, uh, or your average lawyer, they go into those professions because they have a natural flair for it. They have, they have a natural attraction for it. People, people generally end up in professions where they are comfortable in. And um, uh, when it comes to workers and employees, that's unfortunately not the case. If you look at your average worker, and I, I, would, I would go as far as to say 10 people on the street, if you had to ask them, if they were working as employees, are you happy in your employment? Uh, probably the majority of them would say, well, look, I sort of landed up in this job and it's providing me with security and it pays my bills. Uh, but there's no real, there's no real affinity or love or, ex or love for how they express themselves in their profession. From our point of view, we unfortunately, we, sorry, we fortunately mostly have that, but the problem comes with having to sustain that as a career and having to function in an environment where our lives have got the same demands as everybody else. Most musicians, I can tell you now, having spent most of my life around them, are very bad business people. That's why we need managers. That's why we need promoters. That's why we need people to do our marketing and our finance, because we are generally very good at expressing ourselves and being creative and being expressive. But generally speaking, and there are, of course, many, many exceptions, but the general, general rule and those musicians who are experienced in this room, I have no doubt will bear me out. We are generally not good business people. Uh, for veterans like myself, 
uh, it has come with the territory and I've had to teach myself how to run a small business and eventually even employing some people and keeping my business straight in terms of UIF and keeping my, my tax affairs in order, all of that. But those to most musicians, those are occupational hazards. And from that, from that perspective, now one takes a step back and you say, well, how are we different? to others who are who are employed a couple of couple of differences the most obvious one would be that any of us would probably work for more than one employer in a in a in a specific month your average gig musician would work maybe for five or six different employers depending on how many gigs they do some you know a lot of musicians have a regular gig at one specific venue on a friday night so that's four nights which is one employer on a Wednesday night, they might play somewhere else. That's the second employer on a Sunday afternoon. They're doing a gig somewhere else. And that's a third employer. Now, why should that make us different to anyone else? It only does so in the fact that instead of having one employer, it's more than one employer. We provide a service, the same as washing their car or cleaning their house or whatever. And we get paid for it. Same as the domestic worker. But instead of having one employer, there are three, four or five. In the case of musicians who do big shows or whatever, these are promoters. These are uh, the other, in other cases, it's a bar or a tavern or a Shabin owner or a restaurant owner. They vary. But the fact is that from that employment and from earning that money, we have to make a, some sort of a formalized existence yet being regarded as informal. And that is the dichotomy and it also provides us with our biggest dilemma. I'm going to, to just stop there for the moment and then bring your attention to specifically focus around the definition of worker. In our current, in South Africa, we, we are obviously, um, you know, governed. Anybody who's working, who's in the working environment is governed by legislation. In the case of people who are working for employees and anybody else who isn't, we are governed by the so-called Labor Relations Act who, 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 that has been amended uh, sometimes. The Labor Relations Act um, covers the conditions under which a person can qualify as being defined as an employee or a worker. Uh, there are a number of definitions for that and if I can just share, uh, I would like to look at something very important. I would like all of you to take very, very good note of this, what I'm going to show you now. I'm going to show you a graphic of three different definitions of a worker. I'm hoping that everybody's able to see that. Ronnie, uh, is, that, is, that, is, that coming, is that coming up? It's fine. All right. So this is taken from a, a government uh, website where it talks to the labor on, on definition, the labor sector on definition of worker in the, uh, in the national minimum wage bill. But it also talks about other definitions. So the Department of Labor positions itself on the def definition of worker in the national minimum wage bill saying going on to say that the final draft of this bill agreed to by the nedlac constituencies reads as follows worker means any person who works for another and who receives or is entitled to receive any payment for that work whether in money or in kind very important to remember that that is in the national minimum wage bill um the, the, the further, a little bit further down, you'll see I've underlined the basic conditions of employment act. The BC, B, BCEA defines an employee as follows. Any person, very importantly, excluding an independent contractor who works for another person or for the state and who receives or is entitled to receive any remuneration. And any other person who in any manner assists in carrying on or conducting the business of the employer. Now, if you look at that, our biggest uh, obstacle 
to being regarded as normal workers is the second one, the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, where I've circled in orange, excluding an independent contractor. So we have two definitions. I'm going to just stop, stop there for a moment and look you all in the eye. We have two definitions. We have the one where it says anyone who works for another and who receives or is entitled to receive any payment for that work, whether in money or in kind. That's us. I've said earlier, we work sometimes for three, four, five, six employers in one month. We, we provide a service for them. They wouldn't hire us if they were able to do the music. They come to us because they need music, like any other commodity. If they needed onions, they would go to an onion farmer. In our case, they need music. They want to have a festival or they have a bar or they have a restaurant, without which it wouldn't function properly if there wasn't entertainment or music. So we provide that service, that commodity, and in turn, we get remunerated. In our case, there's very little regulation as to how we get remunerated. Now, I'm going to dig into that a little bit further, but let me just stay on definitions for a while. The Basic Conditions of Employment Act throws in that big obstacle that suddenly we defined as informal sector, but now we suddenly, they also raise our status and they give us this wonderful title of independent contractors. So that is the bane of our lives. Ladies and gents, this afternoon, I want to say to you, in grappling with this issue, this is the biggest obstacle that we would have to get around. Legal minds, the likes of Professor Benjamin, who I'm very interested to hear this afternoon, and we've had some dealings with him, wonderful man with great knowledge and skill in the subject. This is what they would have to grapple with. How do we un un-independent contractor ourselves? How do we unformalize ourselves? In my opinion, there is only one way, and that is if the environment in which we operate is more formalized to accommodate us. Let me give you some very simple examples in simple language. When a person opens a restaurant, first thing they do is they apply for a liquor. Are they going to serve booze? They, they battle if they didn't have a liquor license, if they want to have a restaurant. Most restaurants now can't operate if they didn't sell liquor as well. So probably with the exception, you know, of your Islamic, uh, uh, you, you, you know, uh, 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 venues, etc. But generally speaking, uh, restaurants go with liquor or they have a bar as well, or they sell liquor or they serve liquor at the table. So they would have to apply for that. They would, they would also have to apply for a health a health license where the health inspectors could walk into their kitchen at any given time and if things aren't according to specific legislation and rules they will get closed down however they would also either have a stage where live musicians perform or they would have a one-man band performing to backtracks or they would simply have some speakers in the corner with music being played out of that a selection of music probably mostly international that's another issue which we won't discuss today, the ratio of local content versus international, but they would be playing music in one form or another. The difference being, we try to compel them in some way to, and they, they sort of loose, soft glove legislation that says that someone should, if they're gonna play music in a public place, they should be a SAMRO uh, vendor. They should apply for a SAMRO vending license. There's another uh, collecting society, Sampra, who, who collects uh, a slightly different royalty. We're not going to get into that now because we're talking more about the principles of, of collection of royalties that are appropriate. Um, now, unfortunately, these, this legislation is not at all in any way enforced as vigorously or as punctually or as meticulously as liquor legislation or health regulations when it comes to entertainment or music or, or, or you know your collection society licenses it really is a very very easy one to get around and it's an easy one to not adhere to and many many venues outright would say i want nothing to do with samra if you want to samra then for tech i don't need you here i've got musicians that is typically what a musician has to deal with and 
That's the informal part. The informal part is not so much us. It's the environment that's created or not created for us to apply our profession or our skills or our professional skills in that is informal. Imagine, and I'm, I'm here to provide possible solutions. Imagine if legislation was just the same as the other legislations in the same environment, like your liquor and your food licenses, whereby if you are going to have music, you have to have a music license. You pay a small levy, a blanket license, the way it is now for those who are compliant. And every musician is registered as an as a number as a registration number as a professional musician such as in any other profession we Tumsa are up exploring ways of grading grading musicians official gradings where by way of either writing exams or auditions etc etc all of that stuff is not pie in the sky it can be done relatively easy if the will is there so you match that formalization with different categories of venues your five-star hotel with x budget that can afford for instance i'm going to give you an example pagal restaurant in seapoint in cape town they have entertainment or four or a five-piece live band four or five nights a week because that's the the category of venue that they are please just um, uh, uh, if the moderator can just me give me sort of a a guide when i've got sort of five minutes left thanks because otherwise i'll be here all day um so there's a way of categorizing venues where they their levy to, to SAMRO is based on their, their annual turnover or their monthly turnover. And that levy goes into the kitty at SAMRO. I'm not going to elaborate on that either. It's not for this discussion. However, composers get paid and performers get paid according to the leg legislation that exists for that. The missing link is the one that compels venues compels uh, public venues where music is performed publicly to, to have to register that offering to their public, to their consumer. It's very soft glove and it's at best informal. And that's what makes us informal. Now, if each musician had a, had a grading, had a number, had a tax number, had every, when the, they play at that venue, all of that simply goes online and every time that person gets paid, pay as you earn will get deducted automatically like any other employee in a factory or anywhere else. UIF will proportionally get deducted from every bit, whether it gets deducted from one salary a month or four or five smaller salaries a month, it doesn't matter. The systems and the technology is, has been available to us for decades to be able to do that. Some people, and when you start talking about it, and especially to the authorities who are actually benefiting from us being informal, oh, no, that's a bridge too far. The reality is it isn't, folks. I'm quite adamant about that is a very, very doable thing. Now, were we able to do that during the time of COVID? We had an incredible, incredibly vivid um, demonstration or illustration of how vulnerable our sector is, where we were relying solely on the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture to provide us with relief. We had such a dramatic three years or two and a half years during COVID where most of us couldn't even qualify for relief. Why? Because relief was not based on an informal sector criteria. They were based on everybody else's criteria. Where's your, peer, where's your tax pin number? Are you this? Can you show your pay slips for the last few months? Do you have a bank account? Those are all formal things that exist in the formal employment sector. Not with us. We have to make do. The average musician plays on a Friday night and goes to the tour with the managers afterwards and on behalf of the band would get a, a little pile of cash and they would divide it amongst them and they go home and buy groceries for their families, etc. In, in less cases, it will be paid in to, to a bank account with no deductions, etc. So I wish to state thereby that it's the environment that we have to operate in that's informal. There's nothing informal about us. We are formal, formal professionals. 
you can come to my place and I'll show you how formally I can play my instruments and how formally I can produce music that's had this whole country dancing for years. So, before I end this segment, I just want to, 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 to emphasize that what we need to do is to look at that formality versus informality and, and find out how doable it is for us to create a, a, a segmented formal environment for us where any musician is on record, on SARS records, on the Department of Labor's employment records and has access to the same social security than anybody else, which we didn't have a sniff of during COVID. The moment we were shut down, we had no recourse and no musician was able to earn one cent. That illustrated how vulnerable we are. And this is pretty much the situation we find ourselves in now. Tumsa believes there is a remedy. I'm going to park it there and I will continue later and I'd, I'd love to have questions and looking very forward to seeing Professor Benjamin's uh, response. Thanks very much. All right. Um, can you hear so, me? Ronnie, um, uh, sorry, Ro Roger, you are muted. No, no, Paul. I'm sorry, Paul. Yes. The musician was waiting with bated breath for your contribution in response to the problems that is raised. I think the quite importantly, the one thing that has stood out for me out of everything that he said is that the environment within which the musicians operate actually uh, fosters informalization in uh, numerous ways. So hopefully you are working on that uh, both for musicians and for other groups of workers who find themselves in that position. But the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Roger. Well, uh, it's very get, good to have uh, Gaby as my opening act. Um, and there was just the support band. Um, I, I wanted to start off with just one comment, which, which I think is something that Tumza does need to think of. I'm not making it as a critical comment, but just to stimulate the debate. And um, the first point is really that not all musicians have the same employment status. Um, and, and we'll look at those categories, but to, to give you the well-known example, and I'm sorry if this appears that I'm a bit of a, if it's a bit of an American example, but as, as many of you will know, there's a well-known musician whose nickname is The Boss, um, Bruce Springsteen. And the reason for that is in fact that he employed his band. So the members of his support band, I think it was the E Street Band, were employees of um, and, and paid salaries by him. So it, 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 it's, it's a useful example, obviously, that's at a, at a very high, high level. Where obviously, funds were not a problem and you weren't being paid out of the till. But it does show that um, um, musicians are a, 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 a complex category. And, and maybe there isn't a, a one um, size fits all um, uh, uh, answer. Um, the other point just to make is, is obviously, and, and I just wanted to use this as a way of, of, of introducing some of our guests. It's a particular honor that we have a number of very distinguished international labor lawyers um, attending our, our seminar. Um, I'd just like to welcome them by name, Eduardo Alas, who is now um, an extraordinary professor at um, UCT, uh, at UWC, sorry. Um, uh, uh, it's great to have you with us, Eduardo, and, and um, Eduardo will in fact be giving the February seminar, giving a, a European perspective. The other person I wish to particularly welcome is Professor Manfred Weiss. Um, who's been, you know, had a long association with South Africa and um, I'm very glad that he, 
he can join us and hopefully he will he will assist us as he has assisted the country over many years and um perhaps he'll tell us something about his taste in musicians um and, and thirdly um darcy de toy um who though very much a uwc person still is is now based um in in the uk so it's particularly honored to have these um three um very established um headline acts um, participating in our seminar. There are really two things that I wanted to, to look at as, as, the, as the sort of um, text of the seminar. And the first is, as, as um, uh, Gaby has told us, that the definition of, of an employee in both the, the employment, uh, basic conditions of the Employment Act, and for, for these purposes, particularly of the LRA, is basically someone who works for another, excluding an independent contractor. And that definition is the reason why Tumza has not been able to register a, um, a trade union that would cover the majority of its members. So if we assume that Tumza, I think it has 2,500 members, some of them may be ordinary employees. Um, some of them may work for... Um, you know, for, for organizations, they may work for, for, for universities, um, they may be employed by large organizations who do, do um, have, have employees who are musicians. But as I understand, the vast majority of their members are um, not ordinarily considered to be employees. So if we look at the Labor Relations Act, um, the registrar is, when he registers a trade union, is limited to registering one that has employees as members. Um, and, and were Tumza to apply, he would, he would confine its, 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 its registered status to musicians who are employees. Um, as, 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 as Gaby also indicated, there's a wider definition in the National Minimum Wage Act that covers all workers. And um, as, as is well known, um, the, the reconsideration of the definitions of the LRA and, 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 and other statutes are currently before NEDLAC. But, but no, no exact decision has been made as to whether there should be amendments to the Act. Um, the, the next issue that 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 arises is is um, you know whether there is an attack on the LRA provisions on the basis that they don't comply with international standards. Um, and, and there, really, if we look at at the key ILO convention, Convention eighty seven, which deals with um, freedom of association, and collective bargaining. Um, what, what the convention does is guarantee the rights of workers and employers without distinction whatsoever. So that's the language um, of the ILO convention. Uh, those groups of workers are, are guaranteed the right to form um, their own trade unions without um, without a state, state um, or unions of their own choosing without state authorization. So th there is an argument which has been raised a number of times, although it's, it's never gone to court to say that actually, um, if we look at the definition of, the, of an employee in so far as it um, regulates the right to form and register trade unions, um the lra is is not complying with international standards and therefore not you know not complying with the constitution which which guaranteed the right of um you know in 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 the labor clause guarantees the right of of all workers to form um trade unions so there is an argument that insofar as they are workers who are not um, employees. In other words, they are, they are workers in, in the broad sense. Um, they work for another in general terms, but their contract is, is not one of, of conventional employment. Um, 
there's um, a challenge could be made to the LRA on, on the basis that um, it in effect narrows the scope of the labor rights um, set up by the constitution and, and therefore is, is, is unconstitutional and, and an order could be sought um, uh, directing the um, parliament um, to, to reconsider the terms, the definition of employee insofar as it related to um, uh, the organization, uh, the right to, to form trade unions. So there, there's a legal argument there. It would be a constitutional challenge uh, to the terms of of the LRA, um, and I, and I think it's 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 it 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 would have um, a, a great chance of success. And I I would find it surprising if the Department of of Employment and Labour were to um, oppose an application of that type. Um, it, it, it raises quite complex issues about the extent, obviously, to which which uh, the court would interfere in in labour legislation, um, and it, it it may be that the effect is that to say that um, um, you know the the definition of of employee insofar as it regulates trade unions, but not other aspects of the LRA, such as unfair dismissal. Um, do not do not comply with the constitution. So there, there is a, there is a, a constitutional angle. <clears throat> it would be, it would be a long process, but um, it's perhaps something that might be a useful um, threat hanging over over um, uh, the, 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 the the discussions on the LRA at NEDLAC. Um, you know, the fact that there are different definitions in different statutes is, is not an extraordinary thing um, because labor law serves various different purposes and it, it, it may well be that, for instance, the minimum wage we, we've accepted should apply to, to, to informal workers. Uh, equally, you know, the, the definition of an employee in, in the Health and Safety Act, the OSHA, and, and the mine and the mine health and safety act are very wide wider than the because the, there's no reason why only people with a, a conventional contract of employment um should be limited um do, uh, will protection should be limited to them so there, i think there, there are a range of arguments there are obviously strategic issues um is you know one one of the issues that that, that is um, an international phenomenon, and, and uh, it's it certainly been the practice within certain unions historically in South Africa as well, is that you get associations that are in part unions. Um, I think one of the one of the best known examples is is the British uh, National Union of Journalists, which in a sense is, is an organisation that has two sectors, one, one which is the registered union for employees and one which represents um, self-employed journalists. Um, I think the, I, in the past year I dealt with the, 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 the actors union, um, performing art workers equity, PAWE as it was called, um, which was led at one point by, by the well-known actor Ian Stegman. And they certainly sought to to have a status where they were both um, the representatives of 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 employees as well as representing self-employed um, actors in their negotiations with with promoters and and, and directors etc so there are organizational models that do allow um, do allow for um, a hybrid organization to be established um, but it may well be that there's, there, there's at the moment certainly there would be significant um, bureaucratic opposition from from the registrar to, to accepting um, that model but, but there's certainly um, issues that can be explored there. Um, 
the um so, so if one looked closely at tumza i would imagine that that it's 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 um its members fall into three broad categories those who are employees as as normally understood um those who are what are often called dependent contractors people who work for another um but don't have the the you know the, the, the level of of control present that one would associate with with employment and thirdly there would be you know other people who who, who may well not be either uh, employees or independent contractors but genuinely self-employed people um who may well in fact employ others so so whatever model one adapts i think one does have to recognize that that um musicians are a category who who, who are not um uh so they don't have a uniform uh, uniform characteristics um you know the the other point really to make in conclusion is is and i had mentioned the actors um uh, you know while the musicians have a have a high preponderance of informal workers um they're, they're not by any means unique and i'm sure people like, like pat horn who work in these informal sector will give us indications of of other organizational options that may may be appropriate for groups of workers who, who are who are partly employees the, the other issue is, is is the tax issue and it does seem you know um you know legally you you have to pay tax irrespective of whether you're an employee or an independent contractor because the the definitions that SARS uses are, are considerably wider and if you work regularly, you know, the 25% the, the, uh, tax will be levied from you or uh, as opposed to PAYE. Um, but it, it does seem to me one of the, one of the real difficulties is that um, there's no common policy formulation between SARS on the one hand and, 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 and the Department of, of Labor and, and sort of NEDLAC debates on the other. And so, um, it does seem to me that the, the tax relation system could become, you know, properly considered a, a method for, for as um, um, Gaby indicated, allowing people to, to um, you know, benefit from, from social, you know, contributory social schemes. Um, so it, it does seem to, you know, that, um, you know, for Tumza, um, on the one hand you know they, they stress their, their uniqueness and the fact that musicians um play a um you know are, are quite different from many other categories of workers that if you compare tumza to numza there would there would be differences that go beyond one letter um but on the other hand they they share characteristics with this the sort of um you know if one looks at you know groups that are where the informality is particularly problematic, you know, drivers, um, for instance, we've seen with this recent accident um, in, 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 on the East Rand, the, the consequences of people being um, inadequately controlled through health and safety legislation. There are common themes that, that run across groups, and it may well be useful for Tumza, you know, as, as, as part of a larger federation to explore those issues that they, they share with other groups of workers. Um, so yeah, that, that, those are the thoughts I have at this stage. Um, so, so, so back to you, Roger, to um, preside over, over further deliberations. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Paul. Can we just ask uh, Gabriel to reply on what Paul has said first before we open it up for contributions from the floor. So Gabriel, uh, a few minutes just to reply to Paul's submission. Yeah, Thanks. thank you, Roger. Thanks very much. Uh, and I'll be very brief on, on this one. So just in, in starting uh, on a lighter note, Paul, um, I can assure you I haven't been a support act for, for many, many years. And um, such as you were uh, introducing some of the, 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 the highlight, or should I say the main acts in the academic world, 
I'm also honored to be joined by a number of very high profile musicians in the room who I'm not going to mention by name of many of them you might find in your music collection. Um, I want to say that uh, some of the things that were mentioned by, by Paul, uh, for instance, that we look at similarities of other groups that are, may find themselves in our, in our uh, dilemma, ongoing, been doing that for years. Um, other areas that, uh, something for, for instance that you mentioned was uh, Bruce Springsteen employing, employing his, his band. Wonderful. Firstly, that's the United States. Their labor, uh, uh, their ability for their musicians to form labor unions, and that is much advanced to us because of the fact that the Senate has created that environment that provides a more formal uh, uh, environment for them to be in, which is totally different to ours. I can say to you that there are musicians, affluent ones, which in a short period of time may have a couple of hits, four to five years of big hits. They may employ a couple of their key musicians. Uh, for a period whilst they themselves are still raking in the money from one or two or three big hits. But I'm talking more in the context of the, the, the vast majority of musicians that make a lifelong career and they may have, they may never become famous. They may never have a big hit that some of us were fortunate to have, but they sustain a, a career right throughout because that is what they are destined to do on this planet as a profession. That's what they're good at. They're good at making music, whether it even be cover, cover music. So, so that's that's the other thing. And actually, I wasn't pointing at our differences. I was actually pointing at our similarities to anybody else who is employed uh, in, in the sense that we have the same needs as everybody else. Our children go to school. We pay our rent. We pay everything. We, we have all the other um, demands of a society to make a living in and to eke out a living. Now, just in closing, uh, Ronnie, we we recognize very much so that a tiny proportion of our musicians who are our members are full-time employed and i'll give you an example school teachers they are full-time in the music profession which is one of our criteria for joining and then others are uh, mu uh, uh, music uh, professors or music lecturers who are at universities or, or educational institutions that are on those institutions payroll these guys are full-time music professionals, but they are full-time employees. And what we've done, and this is very interesting, there has been one example of a creative sector union that was granted full-time recognition and registration by the Department of Employment and Labor. They were called the Creative Workers Union of South Africa, KUBUSA. They existed some time ago and they messed it up. I'm not gonna go into that. But what they did was, they, they got a few uh, people in the arts uh, and, and allied industry who were full-time employees. They got them to start to apply for the registration as a union. Then the Labor Relations Act does allow such, uh, such a registered union to amalgamate with other so-called, and it's in there and I can actually bring it up now, um, uh, but you know, I'm not going to, uh, if anybody wants the documentation, I've got it for you. But in the Labor Relations Act, it states that a, a labor union has the right to amalgamate with any other labor union, whether such a union is registered or not. So what we did is we, we encouraged uh, a, a couple of these musicians who are our members and said, you guys make a resolution and you make a meeting, all of the criteria that's there for starting a union, keeping minutes, et cetera, et cetera, have a constitution, all of those things were taken care of and you apply then as, as a union. Then as soon as you've done that, you simply amalgamate with Tumsa. That way we, we, we were gonna go about it. And again, the department closed that lid on us whilst previously allowing for it to happen. So it, it just seems that there's one way for us to get around this, and that's to change the uh, stipulations of the Labor Relations Act with regards to the to the status of musicians and other art, arts and cultural professionals. Thank you. Thanks, Gabby, for your uh, reply. Uh, Pat, your hand is up.
Back on. Okay, thanks. Just uh, finding my buttons. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pat Horn. Um, I work for uh, Women in Informal Employment, Globalizing and Organizing. Um, I'm also part of the community constituency um, in Nedlac, uh, where we do represent many uh, workers who are not employees, uh, including street traders, waste pickers, um, uh, home-based workers, uh, taxi drivers, etc. So I think, uh, you know, to me, this discussion, uh, at the moment, it's about one particular sector of workers, which Gabby represents, and we also meet him, you know, in, in Nedlac, where we find we are often uh, singing from the same hymn sheet, because he's, he's I think, uh, um, illustrated very well uh, one particular sector of workers that suffers from a problem that many different sectors of work suffer from, and, and that is the fact that in the changing world of work, uh, we've got a higher and higher proportion of workers who are not employees. Um, so he's talked about one of those sectors and I've mentioned some others. But in fact, one of the reasons we have the problems that he's pointed to is that ever since the ILO, the International Labour Organization, recognized the need uh, to, to do away with decent work deficits uh, in the informal economy, and recognized that among uh, workers, there are waged workers, um, and there are also own account workers. Some people call them self-employed workers. Uh, in Central America, they call them rather strictly own account workers. In countries in Central America, they've developed very oppressive, very impressive bodies of legislation uh, because of the fact that in countries like uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, and in fact, most of Central America, probably 80% of the workforce consists of own account workers. And if they were like us and didn't have laws for those kinds of workers, they would have more than 50% of their workforce not covered uh, by law. This was the position that the Cuban government found itself in in 2010, after the collapse of the sugar industry, and when uh, more and more and more of their workers were in the tourism industry and all doing own account work. And then they adopted their current law, uh, which basically recognizes own account workers, uh, puts in place uh, a labor relations system for them. They are able to uh, join uh, unions on a similar basis to the way employees are able to join unions. And as a result, overnight, uh, all the workers in Cuba found that they were covered, you know, 95% instead of only 25%. So basically, I think the elephant in the room when we deal with any of these sectors is that uh, we, we have to be a whole lot more uh, creative about uh, addressing all of those workers who are not employees, who need to be covered by law, uh, who are neither covered as workers nor are they covered as employers. They're just simply not covered. And they have the kinds of results that uh, Gabriel has been talking about. Um, and they share a situation with some very subsistence-based own, uh, own account workers and also other own account workers that are not so subsistence-based but still have the same decent work deficits. So um, the South African government's been looking into this thing from time to time. Every now and then they, they look at uh, what they call atypical work. Of course, it's not so atypical at all. Um, and they've been, we've been dealing with the government since uh, the 1990s on this issue. We haven't made much progress. There are other countries that have made progress, interestingly more in the non-Anglophone countries. There's a very good law on independent workers in Spain. So, you know, it's not a third world country. Uh, the third world countries I've mentioned, like Cuba and Nicaragua, uh, have very good legal systems. So I think we maybe need to look out of the uh, Anglophone cocoon uh, into legal systems that uh, will get us further in covering all those uh, own account workers in our economy who at the moment 
are suffering the same kinds of problems that musicians uh, are suffering. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Is there anyone else that wishes to make a contribution either to what Pat, uh, ah, I can see uh, Darcy's put his hand up, Darcy Dutoy. Thanks, Roger. And thanks, um, Gaby, for a really interesting talk. Um, I would just like to ask a, a question, really. Um, on the question of registration, because I do think that registering as a union in our current system is really the key to securing all sorts of other rights as well, which workers who are not organised are not in, in a position to do. And um, I can understand why the amalgamation route might not have worked in the sense that two unions can amalgamate, but under the current definition, a union consists of employees. So if an organization does not um, consist purely of employees, then um, it can't amalgamate or register. And it just raises the question whether isn't this a situation where the constitutional challenge that Paul has <clears throat> spoken about um, would be on the agenda? Um, if TUMSA um, has applied for registration as, as a union, because it consists of workers and like the ILO, our constitution guarantees to every worker um, the right to um, form or join the union and, and, and so on. So uh, um, um, that decision by, by, by the registrar, which the registrar is obliged to make under the LRA, that you can't register if you don't consist purely of employees, uh, that refusal seems to me should be open to constitutional challenge. Um, and um, therefore the, the underlying law. And if that, is, if that is the case, then of course, the um, amendment would need to follow. It does raise further implications as well, which I won't really go into, but that is just whether um, if one were to, to go that far, whether one should not also then consider um, what does this mean in terms of the rights which are guaranteed to workers and whether the LRA in its present form would um, um, address those rights or give effect to those rights in the case of workers who are not traditional employees. For example, workers who don't have a workplace. So many organisational rights of um, unions and workers are based on the notion of being in a physical workplace for fixed working hours and take that away. People who work in a virtual environment or as musicians do, that might not be very meaningful. So in order to guarantee the full spectrum of rights for all workers, it seems to me also the way in which the LRA and other laws formulate the, um, um, those rights would need to be revisited. But um, it does seem to me that I mean, this is not the, the forum to discuss this in any practical sense. I'm raising it more as a general proposition, but to consider whether this is not the constitutional question which Paul has referred to. And there is, of course, the precedent of COVIDA, the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act, which had excluded domestic workers. Um, which then was subject to constitutional challenge and ultimately the constitutional court um, did rule in favour of the union of the workers and it was unconstitutional to exclude domestic workers from the act and in fact the Department of Labour, as Paul said, did not oppose it and, um, the, and eventually um, 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 made it its, its job to implement it. So, that is my question. Thank you. Uh, Gabby, do you want to just say something to Darcy before Mario can come in? Yeah, sure. So, Mario, thanks. Um, I, I, I hope you're not thinking I'm chipping in, but but I want to address exactly uh, what what 
Professor Darcy just said now. You know, in our experience, having been at it, hammer and tongs for the last six, uh, seven years to try and formalize our, our union status, um, all roads at this stage are leading to a const constitutional challenge. We all know that that's a very, very expensive exercise. And uh, for us to organize ourselves to the extent where we can raise those finances would be a tall order, I can tell you now. We've, we've looked at the option perhaps of looking at, at of knocking at, at the door of the, the Human Rights uh, Commission. We've had a round with them where, where we sued one of the departments that we had to deal with uh, during COVID, etc. And really, um, you know, eventually, uh, you mentioned the COIDA example, which is a shining example for us that constitutional challenge in, in these instances can, can probably be your, your only and your, and your best tool. So we're certainly looking at that, uh, Professor Darcy, as, as an option. And then uh, lastly, just to also mention, uh, you know, comment on the, the fixed um, uh, workplace. As we all know that there's, a, there's a, a developing trend of employees as well now to start working from home. Uh, it's kind of a spin-off of the COVID era, which was which was by necessity. But many employers are feeling now that perhaps they can, uh, you know, decrease the size of their leased premises by having some of their workforce working at home. We believe that that's going to be an increasing uh, phenomenon going into the future. So there's very good reason for the for the law to be, uh, you know, uh, adjusted to accommodate that phenomenon as well. Thank you. Thanks, KB. Mario? Mario, you on mute. It's still on mute, Mario. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to take you out and give up the space to someone whose machine is working properly while you try and sort out the problem with your machine. Anyone else? There was a question from Solly who raised a question about case law and particularly looking at the Uber rulings uh, that have been made, laid down, which basically gave some status to the Uber drivers in different uh, jurisdictions. If there's anybody that wants to comment to the question raised by Solly in the chat. Darcy, you was... Man for advice, you may speak. Professor Weiss. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, I'm not so sure whether uh, Uber is really helping us, you know, because I think uh, this attempts in many countries to simply widen the notion of employee will come to its end you cannot you cannot simply widen this ocean all the time i think what we have to do is to develop a strategy whereby everybody whatever status he or she has be it employee be it self-employed or whatever does have a certain amount of rights. We have to come to that to that position, in my view. And therefore, I think uh, we should look at uh, 
For example, the report of the ILO Commission on the Future of Work. There we get uh, this idea of the, the guarantee of universal rights. And that's, in my view, a more promising approach than the approach to simply widen the notion of the employee. But let me add uh, two uh, comments. The first comment refers to my own country here in Germany. You know, <laughs> we have, as far as musicians are concerned, uh, these big orchestras and so on. And of course, these people all are full-time employees. There we don't have problems. But we have the same problems you have once these people are uh, self-employed. But at least we do have a rather good system of social security for all artists, not only, by the way, musicians, artists of all kind. But this, of course, is not enough and we should do more for those who are not employees in a strict sense. But here we have a problem not only in Germany, also in other member states of the European Union and on European le uh, Union level. What is, in my view, the big problem? The big problem is that we are focusing too much on platform work. We have now all kinds of uh, regulations and proposals on platform work. But there are so many other vulnerable people being not employees, being, being self-employed, nobody cares. And that's a big, big problem. We should, well, not only focus on these new things. Of course, it's exciting now to talk about platform work. It's something new, you know, it's exotic, you know, but I think it's a, it's a wrong it's a wrong strategy. We should cover those who are self-employed, but who need help, who need protection, whether they are in an area which has nothing to do with platform work or whether they are platform workers, we shouldn't make uh, uh, any kind of difference. We should find a solution for all these people. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Weiss. I, I think you've raised an important point around the kind of preoccupation almost with platform work. Uh, Mario, you want to speak now? Is your computer working? Uh, can, can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. Yes, without taking away from the international legal experts, the like of Manfred, Darcy, and also Paul, um, to, to me, there appears to be two matters at hand. The one is organization, and, and certainly, I mean, Paul and us and others have been pointing out that a trade union can only exist where there's employees being members of the trade union. But, but I also got Gabby to say that it must go beyond to extend rights of employees. Now, I, I, I think we, we are also not looking at one other provision of the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, and, and that is Section 83. Now, Section 83 of the BCA deals with what is called deeming of persons as employees. So the Minister of Employment and Labour can deem certain categories of workers as employees for the purposes of either the BCA or any other piece of labor legislation. Um, and that must come at the advice of the commission. Now, the commission, in terms of the historical operation of the BCA, was located in the Employment Commission, Com Employment Condition Commission. Now, they've subsequently been replaced by the National Minimum Wage Commission. And, and I fear that the National Minimum Wage Commission is almost 
overburdening themselves only with provisions dealing with the national minimum wage um, insofar as either the what the national minimum wage should be or what the national minimum wage should be for particular sectors of the economy like domestic work like farm workers and it is ignored all other functions previously performed by the employment conditions commission so they would be again without taking away what others have commented they, there would be another course of action that could be pursued and and that is to have the likes of the employment condition sorry the national minimum wage co um, commission for them to make a recommendation to the minister of employment and labor and to deem certain categories of workers and in this case performing artists or musicians as employees and certainly the provision of registering a trade union some employment conditions applied to them as employees for the purpose of um or made under section 83 of the of the bca it need not to be for all other employment conditions but it certainly could be for some employment conditions and the provision of section 83 certainly covers many um, other elements of employment law that may become applicable to them um, i'll stop there thank you Sylvia Hammond, your hand is up. Do you want to comment on either that or a new point you want to make, please? Hi, Roger. Thank you. If I can find the correct button. Yep. Um, thank you. Just first of all, following on, yes, from Mario, but also picking up the points from the beginning. Um, starting at the beginning, Yes, the description of the musicians is identical to what happens in the lower informal areas of the construction sector, for example. And yes, there's many others that have been mentioned. And picking up from Darcy's point that we have this focus on a workplace, whereas in fact that becomes less and less relevant as we move on. In South Africa, we have virtually half the population unemployed, making do themselves using their entrepreneurial spirit to create a livelihood, all unprotected. So I was thinking we, we are discussing, as Paul did, from the top down in terms of what our legislation is and what we can do to amend, to create, give effect to the constitutional rights. And it occurred to me that if we turn that upside down, we can go top down, yes, but possibly we need to go bottom up. Thinking about um, Guy Standing and his work on the precariat. Um, one of his first works, I think we're talking 2010, 2013, and certainly recognizing that he's UK, Europe, I understand but may have some relevance for us. He talked about the difference between the precariat and existing traditional labor. A traditional labor had a sense, a consciousness of class, and therefore collective bargaining was a class-based um, situation. Now, if we look at all of the different sectors that we're talking about, and those different examples, it occurred to me that maybe we should think about a bottom-up focus where we, um, standing talks about the creation of a class for itself and whether we shouldn't be thinking bottom-up as well of how do we create a, a consciousness across sectors of the precariat, of those atypical, whatever we're going to call them, those people working, exploiting their own skills in order to create an income. So I just have this thought that maybe we could turn the argument upside down. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Gary, do you want to comment? Because I think that's a very interesting point, shifting the thing on its head. You want to mute, Gary? 
sorry. Th thanks very much, Ronnie. Th thank you, Sylvia. You you've touched on something there that that very much quickly resonates with with members of Tumsa, and that is one of the things that we are pursuing, uh, which for us is a, is a is a very important tool which is not available to us in an environment where it's very much applicable, and that is collective bargaining. Um, as musicians, we are subjected to and we are vulnerable to, to mostly a handful of very, very common exploitative uh, phenomena within our industry. These are being exploited by, you know, for instance, your record labels, your publishers, the broadcasters, the production companies, etc. And uh, apart from that, also legislatively in terms of protecting the fabric of our cultural economy, um, I mentioned earlier, I mentioned, I said uh, local content. Um, I don't want to delve too deeply because again, it's not really for this, but it, in, in, in terms of um, uh, collective bargaining, that would put us into a position to lobby very strongly and very powerfully as a collective to, to, uh, uh, to enable us to, to, to push for the, ex for the uh, expansion of our creative economy beyond just a, a 30 percent access to local content on a broadcaster but rather to have uh, access to 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 uh, state budget to take our cultural product international to take it overseas and to make to make inroads into the international market which is wholly dominated by the us the usa uh, great britain and europe at this stage and yet there's a massive appetite for for our our cultural uh, commodities um, not only music i'm speaking for the musicians but i can tell you now uh, in terms of our crafts our arts uh, our, our performance arts in every aspect uh, and and this is only uh, you know in the cultural uh, the so-called informal sector so um we 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 sorely lack that ability to organize ourselves to mobilize and uh, very simply to uh, you know to collectively bargain ironically to give you an example how, how ridiculous this gets sometimes um i sit on the board of samro now we employ roughly uh, about 200 people let's say those are full-time employees and in fact composers are the shareholders of that non-profit collect collection society and we employ as shareholders 200 people they are full time in the employment of an organization that deals 100% with music. That is all they deal with. And the, 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 the you know, the, the administration of the, the, the royalties generated from that. And in their status as full time employees, they all, be, they all have access to belong to uh, one of our sister, sister unions, which you know, it's been registered for, for decades where we can't register. And yet we are employing these people. So that's the irony of, of, of the situation we find ourselves in. And, um, and I, I still like the idea. I love the idea of the bottom up approach. Sylvia, I think you put your finger on it. Mario mentioned uh, the commission. Um, uh, it's now changed its name, but definitely I think there's so many other options, but ultimately I think we need to make a turn at Nedlac and make some real inroads there. Um, uh, Pat Horn, uh, it was great seeing her here. We are we are at least represented there, thankfully, by via Corsatu, but um, we may need to challenge the constitution at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you think you have any closing comments you just want to make because we approaching the five Thanks very much, Roger. No, it's been a very useful debate, and um, hopefully um, we'll be able to, you know, take it a step further um, in, in the following seminar or where, webinar where we, we look at the um, European experience and, and see what, what further examples come from that. But it does seem, you know, in a sense, for, for Tumza and for, for those it's working with, um, you know, the situation is obviously not ideal currently. There are numerous strategies that have been suggested, and I suppose you know um, what needs to be done is to to explore those and 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 you know prioritise which which challenges are run first. So thanks very much, everybody, for being here. Um,
um, and hopefully you'll be at our future deliberations. Thank you. Uh, Gabby, do you want to make some closing comments, please? Yeah, just, just saying thanks again, uh, uh, Roger, and uh, to the University of the Western Cape, uh, to all the, the you know, the, the, the wonderful people that being here, taking part in this, whether academics or, or musicians or music industry, sector people, labor people. We really appreciate each and every one of you uh, for, for caring enough, you know, to examine uh, our dilemma, to, 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 talk, to talk about these issues and uh, to show the willingness to tackle them in the weeks, months and years going forward. We look forward to a, a, an income that we could all, an outcome that we could all, always all be proud of. I'm sure that will involve an income as well. Thank you.